Lex Arcana is a tabletop RPG by Leonardo Colovini, Dario De Tafoli, Marco Maggi, and Francesco Nepotello, originally published in 1994 and re-released in 2019. At the time of recording, it's published and distributed by Acheron Games, the same folks out of Italy who have brought you Broncolonia, Apocalisa, and Inferno, all of which I've reviewed on this channel. The premise of Lex Arcana is relatively straightforward. It's an alternate history setting that presupposes a few things. One, the world has magic, including and most importantly, the magic of divination. Two, the Roman Empire embraced this magic from early in its existence and used it to withstand existential threats. And three, as a result of one and two, there was no rise of the Jesus myth or a church based on it. Instead, when the year we would call 476 AD came around, the Roman Empire was flourishing. With one caveat, they had been complacent about magic, and their enemies, competing tribes, cults, upstart regions, you name it, have begun to surpass them in magical knowledge and prowess. Thus, the empire faces its greatest existential threat in centuries. To combat the threat, it has formed elite task forces that happen to operate in groups of three to five and are composed of highly skilled operatives who vary in expertise. In this video, I want to show you the major Kickstarter that is running for this game's expansion at the time of recording, then show you the full scope of the game currently, as it is composed of a thick set of books, and finally in detail walk you through the core rulebook so you can get a solid idea of the mechanics and the setting. And at the end, I'll give my honest take on this game, even though I've only read the core rulebook so far. Lex Arcana is already composed of a core rulebook and seven comprehensive expansion books, but there is yet to be yet another expansion of the game, three of them actually. At the time of recording, there's a Kickstarter offering three new books, arguably the most interesting yet. The first is Roma, a detailed treatment of the capital city of the Empire. I think if there's one place to run the ultimate urban campaign in Lex Arcana, it would have to be in the capital city, so this could be a pretty foundational book. The second book on offer is Rise of Atlantis, which is actually the game's first campaign book. As you might imagine, this takes the setting into the fantastical realm of aquatic-themed creatures and locations. It's hard to say if they'll stick the landing on this one, but the legend of Atlantis itself actually goes back to Plato in 360 BC, so it's not that far afield for ancient Rome. The third book in this Kickstarter is The Fall, which is also not a setting expansion so much as it's the launch of a meta story that takes place in the game's world. It establishes some ground-shaking events in the imperial government and introduces a singular supernatural threat to the current regime. All in all, these three books appear to offer some really fresh air to the Lex Arcana line. I'll be interested to see how they pan out. And I'll leave a link below to the Kickstarter if you're interested. So Lex Arcana in its current state is what I would term very mature. The core rulebook for the second edition of the game runs about 302 pages. Just a note on the print quality, these books are printed in Lithuania. I'm not sure which company, but the quality is outstanding. Thick covers, heavy paper, rich colors, stitched binding, all the trappings of a deluxe RPG book. As mentioned a minute ago, the game's actual product lineup goes pretty deep. After the core rulebook, you have Italia, Land of Ancient Magic and Dark Intrigue. This is the thickest of the expansion supplements, running 260 pages. It's a staggering basket of new region details, more gods, crime syndicates, magic cults, new magic beyond divination, weapons, creatures, NPCs, and a sample adventure. I'm not going to go through any of these expansion books in detail, but I want you to at least see them all so that you can get an idea of how mature and deep this game is at this point. Mysteries of the Empire Volume 1 is actually the shortest of the supplements, running 128 pages and contains 10 adventures. They're all presented in relatively short scene prompts, which I find very appealing. Mysteries of the Empire Volume 2 runs 180 pages and contains 11 more adventures. Egyptus, the Sands of Time and Gold, focuses on northeastern Africa for the most part and runs about 180 pages. This one really highlights some of the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire, both in actual history and in this alternate one. The creators are not phoning it in with these supplements, by the way. They break a lot of imaginative new ground with the creatures, for example. Dacia and Thracia, Storm at the Empire's Borders, runs about 160 pages and also takes you to the edges of the Empire, but probably not as culturally and mythologically distinct as Egyptus. Nevertheless, 
The region it covers is where present day Transylvania is located, so you can guess what kind of creatures you might be facing in this one. Britannia of mists, specters, and sorceries takes you to a very familiar island. I've never quite seen Britain portrayed in this fashion, but just from the look of this map, you can get a good idea of how the authors are trying to bring a fresh approach to some well-trodden ground. Acheron also sells a Lex Arcana GM screen, and it's got most of the tables you'll need. One thing we haven't gotten to yet, but I'll tell you now, is that the game's mechanics are a tad more complex than average. So even if you don't use a GM screen, you're going to want a cheat sheet like this. Okay, let's get into the core rulebook here. First thing is, your character is a sort of special agent called a custos, or custodes in the plural. As you might have guessed, this means keeper, guardian, or custodian. Each custos is trained as part of a cell called a contubernium. This is just the Latin word for the smallest organized unit of soldiers in the Roman army. Just as a word of warning here, this game is absolutely loaded with Latin terminology, all of which has an easy enough translation into English, but on occasion when I walk you through the character creation and mechanics, you might catch a few of these. As a player, you choose from five so-called offices. These are essentially classes. Fighter, Explorer, Augur, who specializes in divination magic, Scholar, and Diplomat. You're chiefly composed of two kinds of core attributes, six virtues and six categories of skills. One other really notable feature of your character is their Pietas. These are used to perform magic or invoke divine protection. I'll be frank with you here, the character creation is a bit harrowing in this game. It involves using a worksheet to calculate various attributes and then transcribing those calculated values to your actual character sheet. I planned on walking through this entire process, but I thought maybe I'd better just skip it. The core rulebook does come with 10 pre-generated characters that you can tweak and adjust the details of if you're itching to just jump right into the game. There are a few super important things to note in character creation. One is that the province that you hail from, and there are officially 20 in the Roman Empire currently, affects your skills modifiers. But alternatively, there's another method of developing your PC's background details based on their birthplace generally. Depending on if you were born in a civitas or great city, or colony or a village, etc., you can choose a role for one of six skill modifiers, and the book provides an extended example rationalization for each possibility. And there's actually a sixth office or class that you can play, the assassin, who always has a cover class so they can hide their true job. My biggest question here is how to handle that secret at the table. Are other players supposed to know that one PC is an assassin? It would actually be hard to hide that if the player uses one of these two special talents. So the way the game actually works is, anytime you need to make a check, you pick a virtue or a skill that would apply. If it's a skill that has a specialty, you add that to the rating. That's how many dice points you have to work with. For example, if my PC Gaius Valerius has a nature score of 15 with a plus one hunting specialty, a hunting check would be 16 dice points. I can then roll up to three dice whose max value is at or under 16. So for example, I could roll a d12 and a d4, or 4d4, or 2d6 and a d4. When I roll these dice, I'm trying to exceed the difficulty threshold, and the range for that target number in this game is best described here. In this game, the die result has to be over the target number to be counted as a success. It can't be equal to. Once I roll all the dice and count up the number of successes, I can figure out my degree of success. Note that one to three successes is only considered a marginal success. Herein lies the perpetual dilemma for the player. Do they choose to roll a bunch of smaller dice and have a chance at more successes? or do they roll fewer, larger dice in order to have a higher chance at exceeding the target number? Combat is fairly involved at first blush, but it's actually not that bad if you're acclimated to how the dice work generally. In close combat, both combatants roll their debello, or combat skill, plus any applicable specialty, and compare the results. The higher roll makes that roller the attacker while the other becomes the defender. A tie means that nothing happens and you move on to the next engagement, or in the round if there are no others in the fight. Using that same combat roll, you subtract one from the other to get an attack potential. So for example, my guy Gaius Valerius is fighting a genie and rolls an initial combat or debello roll of 7. The GM rolls a 9 for the genie. 
That means the genie is the attacker and Gaius is the defender. Then we compare those two roles, but there's a bit of a special case if a character has a shield. You add the parry value of the shield when calculating attack potential. So in this case, Gaius has seven plus two from his shield, which is nine, equal to the genie's role. So it cancels out, he blocks the attack. But let's say in another clash, the genie rolls up a 10 and a Gaius rolls a four. Well, we have to remember to add that parry value from a shield. So it would be 10 minus six from Gaius, resulting in an attack potential of four. This table tells us that an AP of four through six results in doubling the dice points used to roll for damage. Let's say the genie's weapon has a damage rating of five. With the doubling, that gives it 10 dice points to roll for damage. Keeping it simple, let's roll 1d10 for damage, getting a six. Gaius Valerius has armor protection that gives him d3. He rolls that and gets a two. So six minus two is four total damage, which is subtracted as hit points. If all of your hit points are filled with either an X from damage or a slash from encumbrance, then you pick up the condition fatigued, and that can severely reduce your skill ratings temporarily. You are considered dying when you have no more hit points to lose and you take any more damage. At this point, you will die if you don't receive first aid within a short amount of time. You can also naturally heal three points overnight or over the course of half a day out in the open, or potentially more if you're resting in a comfortable place. I know that later expansions for this game open up the kinds of magic that you can perform, but I did find it interesting that in the core rulebook, you're only presented with six sub-disciplines of divination. In fact, the Roman Empire in this setting owes the foundation of its survival to divination magic. If a Custos or PC wants to enjoy the effects of divination, they have to successfully perform one of these eight rituals. To do that, they choose one of the six subdisciplines, then spend the required number of pietas and make a demagia or magic roll against a specific difficulty threshold as specified on this table. If they nail the dice roll, they get an answer from the GM. If they fail, they still get a small degree of success, but then have to pay more spirit points and roll again. Notice the word must here. They have to spend follow-up points on a failed magic roll, which means that if they have a string of bad rolls here, they could quickly exhaust all of their spirit points, at which point another failed roll means that they get a nonsense answer from the GM. Let's take a look at one of the eight rituals that a PC can perform in order to get a magical answer out of the GM. It's worth noting that all of these rituals require a quiet place, safety, and complete concentration. Omen has a difficulty threshold of six and costs six spirit points per attempt. Anytime party members witness something strange or ominous, they can perform Omen and get an interpretation. With higher degrees of success, they get a more detailed warning of what's to come. There are actually other ways to lose precious spirit points besides spending them on divination rituals. You can lose them by getting involved in any way with forbidden cults, which is to say each PC is associated with very real gods who watch them constantly. And if that PC annoys or makes any of those gods jealous, they can lose spirit points. Here's a short list of other ways to annoy the gods. All that being said, you can recover spirit points relatively quickly. You get all of them back at the end of each adventure, for one, but you can also make rolls at certain times whenever the GM thinks it's appropriate and claw back some points that way. I've got to admit, the advancement mechanics in Lex Arcana are probably some of the most complex I've ever seen. You advance along eight different curricula, and each one of those has a different multiplier. You automatically get experience points at the end of each adventure, and those translate one for one into curriculum points that you use to increase skill and skill specialty ratings. But at the end of every adventure, you also make two unmodified rolls against a DT of three, and those roles generate more curriculum points. Those two roles are based on your intellect and your authority ratings. The important thing to note here is that you keep track of the number of curriculum points that you acquire, and eventually you actually rank up in the special Praetorian chapter that you're a member of. Each time you rank up, you get to choose one of four things. Training, which increases one of your virtues by one, quality equipment, an actual personal assistant, or a trained animal. As far as assistance and animals, you can only have one at a time. And as you rank up, you also naturally start accumulating divine invocations called 
indigimenta. They confer immediate benefits as opposed to divination rituals, so you can only invoke them once per adventure. They range from things like recovering a few spirit points, to creating sunshine in a forest, to speaking with the dead, to creating an invisible shield, stunning an enemy, really all kinds of things that in high power fantasy would be considered minor spells. But since magic in this game is meant to be difficult to achieve and to grasp, these invocations are very limited in your ability to use them and their overall effects. The GM section of the book offers extensive guidance on how to actually run the game, conjure up the right target numbers, and how to make adventures from scratch. There are also about a hundred different NPC archetypes statted out, not to mention common animals, and about 55 pages of fantastical beasts and creatures. You get a lot of the Greco-Roman classics here, like harpies and hydras, as well as an extended section on vampires. I've always loved the concept of vampires in ancient Rome, and if that's something that you love as well, remember to check out the Dacia and Thracia supplements for this game, which zeroes in on ancient Transylvania. The setting section of the book runs about 30 pages, but it's really one of the most dense and important for a GM to read. No matter how much you actually know about ancient Rome, you really need to read as much of this section as you can in order to see what is different in this alternate history. And in a perfect world, it wouldn't just be the GM reading this section either. Players would greatly benefit from reading a lot of this, including the section on the Cohors Arcana which is the secret Imperial super squad that they're a part of. Not to mention the fact that every major weapon type is described and illustrated in this chapter, something I deeply appreciated. It's really nice to have these illustrations. The organizational structure of the empire also seems pretty indispensable for everyone to know. This actually brings up a major problem I tend to have with tabletop RPGs, which is oftentimes players will come to the table not having read much about the setting their character has lived in their entire life. And it results in the PC being oddly ignorant of their own world. But that being said, a chapter like this one is a lot of reading. There are 20 detailed provinces, for example, and as eager as I was to absorb it all myself, I did find myself getting a little cross-eyed after about the 10th or 11th province. I guess as far as provinces go, players don't really need to know about more than one or two. That would jibe with a PC's actual knowledge in real life, unless they were a lifelong diplomat or statesman who had the rare privilege of traveling the empire for decades. There are two adventures included at the end of the book, each running about 25 pages and consisting of about a dozen scenes each. I'm not going to go through them because I don't want to spoil them. So all right, here are my thoughts on the Lex Arcana 2nd Edition Core Rulebook by Acheron Games. Some reading required. As I was just saying, I think a distinct game setting such as this one really just requires that everyone commit to some reading before playing. Either that or the GM needs to carry the table, so to speak, and accept the task of explaining the world to the players over the course of several sessions. A task I don't think is fair to any GM. One possible solution here is to meet players halfway and have a relatively short document that summarizes the most important information about the setting. Things like the name of the current emperor and the names of the gods who the PCs are supposed to worship. So maybe like three to five pages as opposed to 30 full pages of text wall. Complex XP system. It took me a couple of passes to understand how character advancement works and I'm not convinced that it needs to be as complex as it is. You have experience points and curriculum points and multipliers for eight different categories, and those multipliers can change if you want them to. It's just a lot. Maybe it could be slightly simpler. Ancient Rome media touchstones. Okay, so there's actually another workaround for players who don't wanna read before playing this game. And the answer lies in the fact that there are thousands of hours of entertaining movies, TV shows, and video games set in ancient Rome. It's a genre unto itself, and players can do backstrokes in all the cool visual stories told in that era. If they have that imagery couched in their minds, then connecting them into the setting of Lex Arcana would not be too much of a task. Fascinating dice system. Everyone at the table has to constantly weigh probabilities between different dice. With the dice point system, you're basically buying dice before every single throw, and the dice types that you choose will affect your chances at success in a pretty thought-provoking way. Magic is rare. I like that you're not throwing spells around in this game. A divination ritual could take your character hours and result in your spirit points completely used up. And divine invocations can only be used once per adventure. And those invocations are not exactly game-breakingly powerful either. 
deep well of supplements. The amount of writing and artwork and thought that has gone into this game's mechanics and setting expansions is staggering. I'm not sure if you could ever really play your through all of the setting expansions. Honestly, you'd have to spend several months just to read through them all. And that's a nice feature to have for a game where the amount of official playable content runs very deep and wide. That's not to mention the fact that there are several more books in the works at the time of recording. The latest Kickstarter includes a detailed setting expansion of the capital city of Roma, the game's first campaign book, Rise of Atlantis, and the game's first meta story treatment, The Fall. I'm not really sure there is an ancient Rome fantasy RPG more unique and fully developed than this one. This game has essentially been in the oven since the 1990s, and it is so well baked by now that it's almost a lifestyle choice to really understand and embrace the totality of the setting. Which is to say, it's not a casual game for non-committal GMs and players. It would require some real effort to get everyone read in on the unique mechanics and the important quirks of the alternate history. But if you're into ancient Rome with a healthy splash of the supernatural while still being gritty and relatively deadly, then it's a no brainer. You'll have to check this one out for yourself. I've left links for everything below. Thanks for watching. See ya.